here we are with Mallory Blackman. She's an OBE. She's written over 60 books, haven't you? Yeah. I'm working, I'm actually on my 70th. Oh my god. Working on my 70th. Yeah. And she's only, she's only 70. So, so <laughs> no. she's, she's, she's writing at a pace here. <laughs> and uh, she's not really 70. <laughs> oh, I don't know. Sometimes I feel it, but there you go. <laughs> But they're um, not all novels. No, they're not all novels. So no, so, but yeah. you have you, you you're a prolific creator. In fact, not only of books because you've written two stage plays, correct? Yeah, I've, I think I've written one stage play, and I used to write for Biker Grove, and I've written some stuff for TV, some you know ch um, stuff for children's TV, and I I did the first four episodes of Pick Up Boy when that was on the telly, and I did we, uh, uh, we had three series of another book of mine called WYSIWYG, and I used to write episodes for that, so I've written some stuff for TV as well. So you're just the ultimate creator and you're just going to keep on creating. It's so exciting to watch you. I suppose you're, are you most famous, would you say, for Noughts and Crosses? I think so. I, I think, think so. that's the book most people seem to know me for, whether they've read it or not. That seems to be the one that people know about. Um, that one, and I think that series and Pick Up Boy seem to be the ones that people seem, tend to know the most. Yeah, it's such an it's such an amazing sequence, and um, I, I love it so much. And it's interesting because it's it's kind of well, you didn't write it based on Romeo and Juliet, but then that kind of occurred to you later. And of course, your latest published book, Chasing the Stars, is um, a retelling kind of of, yeah. of Othello. So Shakespeare's been very important to you. I know you've spoken a lot about Shakespeare in Shakespeare Year, but do you want to tell us a little bit about how um, Shakespeare's writing and stories inspired you? Well, I think um, it was one of those things when, when I was at school, my first encounter with Shakespeare was when I was in Year 7, the equivalent of Year 7, and we did A Midsummer Night's Dream. And I hated it. I thought, <laughs> oh my God, I absolutely hated it. And I was reading through it thinking, this makes no sense. I don't understand what this is about. And, um, and then we kind of, and I thought, oh God, Shakespeare sucks. And then, um, and then we started Julius Caesar. And I thought, oh, I, was, I was still struggling with the text and, 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 and interpreting it and, and trying to grasp its meaning. And then the te our teacher said, right, we're all going to see the film of Ju Shakespeare's Julius Caesar. And it, and it was a film of Marlon Brando. And I thought, oh my God, Marlon Brando, this is going to suck. And, we, and, and I wasn't alone. We all thought it was going to be dreadful. So we all went into the assembly hall. And I sat there watching it. And it was amazing. It was brilliant. And I actually understood what was going on. And then we did Macbeth, and they took us to the theatre to see a production of Macbeth, and I understood what was going on. And I really believe Shakespeare's one of those things where if you do it and you're sitting there and you just got to read the lines or you get a part or whatever, you don't, it, it's harder to grasp the meaning than if you go and see a performance or if you stand up and act it out. They are plays, they're supposed to be acted out. So, you know, the Royal Shakespeare Company had a, a scheme a while ago where it was Shakespeare on its feet. And it, it really is about kind of standing up and doing Shakespeare. And it makes so much difference. So I actually fell in love with him. And I, and I sat down and I, wrote, I read Hamlet off my own bat and King Lear and all the tragedies. And, um, and in fact, um, the first novel I read that featured a black character was The Colour Purple but, um, by Alice Walker, and that was when I was 21, 22. But the first black character I encountered in literature was Othello, Shakespeare's Othello, and that was when I was um, 17, doing my A-levels. And I remember, because I started off doing a, a chemistry A-level, and I was three weeks into it, and I thought, oh, I don't think I want to do this anymore. What should I swap to? And I thought, I'll swap to English. So they'd already started Othello, so I had to kind of read it and catch up. And it was the first black character I'd encountered, and I loved the play so much, I thought, one day I'd like to do my own version of this. So it's and that's how so, Chasing the Stars that's came what about. Happened. Um, but it's amazing that you thought that before you were ever a writer. Yeah. But were you right, when you were, when you were 17, 18, were you writing that you... Were you I writing was, all the for time? For my own amusement. I was writing... I, I mean, I was writing stories and poems for my own amusement from the time I was, um, I'd say, about seven or eight. And I used to write them in my English books. And I was really lucky with my English teachers because they didn't say, stop wasting school paper. They would kind of mark them and give me comments. And then my, when my parents split up when I was 13, I felt there was no one I could really talk to about that. So what I did is I poured out my feelings into poems and stories. And, uh, and I started keeping a diary. And that's a really good way of getting into that habit of writing every day and, and not being afraid to put, put real thoughts and feelings down on paper. I mean, there's stuff I wrote which I would never show anyone. Do you have it, though? 
somewhere in the house, probably, oh. yes, but I would, would never show anyone. Even my hobby hasn't seen that <laughs> lot, so, you know, but it's, it's, it, but it's it actually, it, I didn't realise it at the time, but it was getting me into that habit of not being afraid to be truthful about f feelings, even negative ones. And so when I read that, I thought, I, oh, maybe I'll do my own sort of short story or something based on Othello. But... Um, when I was doing Noughts and Crosses, it was, I mean, it is very loosely based on Romeo and Juliet, but again, when I started it, it was only when I was halfway through and I thought, oh, this reminds me a bit of Romeo and Juliet. It's not like it was a conscious decision. Um, and then, you know, and, I, and, and even to the extent where when the book was published, um, one of the reviews said, well, this is obviously Romeo and Juliet. It's even got its own balcony scene. I mean, uh, and, I, and I thought, oh, God, yeah, there is a bit on the balcony. And, you know, so that had kind of you know, subconsciously done. But with this one, I very much wanted to sit down and I wanted to do my own version of Othello and someone who... Uh, falls in love for the first time and, and is totally swept away with that feeling and then somebody's whispering in their ear and saying, don't trust him, don't trust him. I mean, with Othello, it was um, his, his, one of his, his ensign and a good, he thought was a good friend, Iago, say, and he falls in love with Desdemona and Iago's whispering in his ear saying, don't trust her, she's having an affair with somebody else and, and uh, slowly Othello begins to believe Iago rather than... Desdemona, and then he thinks he finds proof, and he ends up smothering her. He ends up killing her, and only then does he find out that actually what Iago really is. And the interesting thing about Othello is, even though Othello is the, type, the, the sort of eponymous type, um, hero of the book, he gets 25% of the lines in the play, and Iago gets 31% of the lines. So really, it's and I think Iago is the third biggest part in Shakespeare's kind of canon. So, so you know, you get lots of um, actors who really love playing Iago. But I thought I'd really like to do it, but I'd like to do it from my Othello character's point of view. So my girl is called Olivia, or V for short, and she's telling the story alongside the Desdemona character, which is a boy called Nathan. So I kind of switch things up, but it, is it, ostensibly it's a sort of st story of her falling in love with Nathan and her brother Aidan, my Iago character, is whispering in her ear and saying, don't trust him, don't trust him. So I mean, you, it's set in space. How yeah. many of you have actually read it, Chasing the Stars? Well, a, few, Ooh, okay. a few, but you've you've all the rest of you who haven't, you've got a big treat in store, and you've got you've got to read it immediately <laughs> tomorrow. You must go and buy it um, because it's absolutely brilliant. Oh, but of course, you, it's set in space, yeah. Um, and it so, but it, you you didn't start off setting it in space, did you? I did. Your first idea? No, originally it was going to be set in a boarding school. Would you believe? And I I was a sort of fifty pages in, and it just wasn't working. And she kept saying, "I'm in space." I'm, I'm alone on a spaceship trying to get back to Earth. I'm in space. And I'm thinking, Shakespeare in, a, in space, really? I don't think so. So I was kind of trying to write it, and it just wasn't coming. So in the end, I thought, oh, God, let me just try, try this. And, and she, her whole crew had been wiped out by a mystery virus, including her parents. And it's just her and her brother desperately trying to get back to Earth. And she's been alone for three years on her way trying to get back to Earth. When they pick up ref these refugees, and one of the refugees is Nathan. And so, you know, so as soon as I said it in space, it was just kind of, I was away with the story. So it was one of those things where I thought, a Shakespeare in space, really? I don't think so. <laughs> Although, you know, one of his books, um, The Tempest, was done as Forbidden Planet in the 1950s. And yeah. I love that film. So, you know, so it's not like it hasn't been done before, but I was thought I'd rather kind of set it in the here and now, but it just didn't work when I did that. Do, do you find that your characters do speak to you like that? Oh, often? Gosh, yes. So is your head, like, awash with characters? Yes. You told me, <laughs> just in the, in the very dark green room, just mm -hmm. around there... Um, that you have often have like six or seven right, real proper ideas all in your head at the same time. So do you ever feel that's just driving you a bit crazy? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, my mum thinks I'm a bit weird, but I always have been. But, um, but you know what? But I have six or seven ideas in my head, but I only work on one book at a time. And, I only, and the characters of one book at a time talk to me, otherwise I really would kind of think... So you have to discipline, you have to close the doors to the other uh, ones. To the others and do, just concentrate on Do they on try that and one. get in, though? Or are you just saying no? Sometimes, but I just kind of think that you'll have to wait your turn. And, I, you know, and, and for me, it sounds really weird, but for me, 
that's when I know a book is working, when my characters feel like real people to me. Mm. And, and to that extent, I do a sort of a mini biography of all my major characters, sort of um, wh what kind of music they like, what kind of food they're into and so forth. So they really become real people. And then I will start. And I don't start until it's almost like they are talking to me. So I'm basically trying to record everything they do and say. It's almost like a film running in my head and I'm just trying to record it. So that's how I kind of that's, write. That's an interesting thing to say that it's like a film. So I think that's the experience of reading your books. I, I'm, I've made a realization. Every time I read your books, I always read them in one night. It's, oh, really, yeah. it's kind of annoying <laughs> to have to stay up at like three in the morning <coughs> to read your book. But, um, but it's a bit like watching a film. You just can't really put it down. Well, you know, um, I think when I, when I started, the books that worked for me are the ones where you kind of where you really want to know what happens next. Yeah. And, and, and when I, I went to the National Film and Television School in the 1990s, and my, um, so my MA is in script writing, so it's kind of very much the way I work. It's, it's about trying to do it as filmically as possible, like a film running in my head, and I'm just trying to record it. And, and that's why, you know, I, I, I do love sort of more you know, literary works for adults, etc. but I do hate books where I kind of, I'm, I'm reading them, and I get to, like, page 50, and I think what is this book about? <laughs> and then no matter how beautifully written, I kind of think, yeah, but I want a plot. I want a story. I want to get to know the characters rather than the writer trying to dazzle me with their sort of literary prowess. And I'm afraid, at, I just think now, if you don't grab me by like the third or fifth chapter, then, you know, you're going down. I'm sorry. You're going down. You're going down. <laughs> so, you know, because I just think, I, 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 or even though, I mean, there's certain people who can do both, who are very, who write beautifully and they can tell a story. But that's why I love reading books for children on YA as well, because they are so brilliantly written, mm. but we've got the plot there and it's kind of about getting to know those characters and, and, and the story moving forward. And I love that. Yeah, you are, you are, you are the queen of plot. You're, you're always, you're <laughs> always you. plotting. Um, so with Chasing the Stars, um, it's a very claustrophobic atmosphere on that, sh on that um, spaceship. Spaceship? Mm. <laughs> I suddenly couldn't think of the word there. <laughs> Isn't it? I suppose that would have been a bit like a, a bit like a school, but it's so yeah. much better to have it set in space. Do you, do you, do you, do you think the location is really important? Have you done that before when you thought something would be based in one place and then, yeah. it's, then it all changes for you. I think, yeah, I think in this, the location is definitely yeah. almost another character in that it means they, ha they are all together and they have to work together. And then, and, and throughout it also, there's, there are people being bumped off. And so it has to be someone on board. So it must be one of the refugees she picked up because she, she knows it's not her. And why would her brother do that? So it must be one of them. But yeah. why would one of them start bumping off the others? And it's that whole kind of feeling of claustrophobia and everybody sort of living sort of cheek by jowl and kind of, and then that, that and upping that sense of threat. And it's sort of like, you know, it's sort of like, um, and then there were none, the Agatha Christie story, but it's all set on an island so nobody can escape. And it instantly that setting gives you a, that, that sense of threat which you can then play with. So it's kind of, for me, um, it, I, it, it lent itself to the story in that it's kind of who can she trust mm. and something's going on here and, and it's Nathan somehow involved in this and, you know, and it's sort of like suddenly she thinks she's, she's, she thinks she's beginning to get to know them and then the deaths start happening and it is this whole issue of trust and kind of everybody looking at everybody else, which I really wanted to play with in it. And there's a real political undertone, isn't there? Because the, basically she picks up refugees. Mm. So how much was that playing in your head? Because um, while you were writing it, obviously the newspapers were full of yeah. these well, I stories. Don't think, I don't think any writer writes in a vacuum. So for me, it was, um, it was around the time when we were getting rhetoric about the, the refugees and people calling them cockroaches and vermin and all this sort of business. And they're human beings, for God's sake. And it's just... And I wanted to play with that, where she picks up the refugees, but she's been told certain things about the type of people they are. And she then has to kind of learn the truth. And, and, so, and even some of her language is um, dubious to begin with, because it's the way she's been brought up. And she was told a certain thing about these refugees. They, they're known as drones, and they work, they, they work in mines and so forth. But she was brought up, told a certain thing about them. So now she has to kind of relearn that and realize that she's been the, her, her misinformed. 
And, uh, and so I, I think, you know, the, 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 sho the rhetoric around the refugees I thought was quite shocking. Mm. Um, and now, we, you know, we get more and more images of p uh, children being bombed and, and, and adults being bombed and, and having to dig people out of the rubble. And they're just trying to, and I think if we, if we were in that situation, we'd want to get the hell out of there as well. So I just wanted to kind of bring that into it as well, this whole idea of refugees and how they are perceived and what they're fleeing from. And when you're, when you're in a safe environment, how it's very hard to kind of, even though you see those images, unless you're actually walking in someone else's shoes, it's very hard to kind of empathise with that. I mean, your books always help people walking walk in other people's shoes mm. so dramatically. I mean, noughts and crosses is such an example of that. And I'm, I'm sure you change a lot of people's lives and perceptions with noughts and crosses, don't you <laughs> well, think? I mean, it's just... Well, I mean, a, a, on, on, on matters of race, yeah. that is a book that I, I've seen so many teenager, teenage readers, um, just the first time younger people have actually ever thought about those issues. I've, well, yeah, I've, I've had a lot of letters from people saying they, it made them really sit down and have a think about race, which is lovely, I mean. And I think, again, it, for me, it was about... Um, for me, the, the stories I love are the ones where you absolutely can put yourself in someone else's shoes and think, what would I do if I were in that situation? And, I, and that's what I wanted to do with Sefi and Callum, and kind of, so that Callum, oh, yeah, Callum becomes a terrorist, but I wanted people to read that and think, and, and see those steps that drove him to become a terrorist. Not that I want people to have sympathy with terrorists, not at all, but I wanted people to understand what drove him to that point. And, I, and, you know, and that's why it was very important for me that it was kind of told from both of their points of view. Um, and, you know, and, and it's one of those things that it also meant I had to be kind of very even-handed in the way I told their story because I didn't want to... It's not like I'm saying, you know, here is the lesson for today or any of that. It's kind of like, these are their lives. You make up your own mind. And, and, and kind of raising these subjects for discussion but certainly not saying, pretending to anybody that I've got any answers, because I don't. But, uh, you know, but raising topics for discussion, I love. But it's not like... It, the, the politics doesn't come first for you. It's a no. story that comes first. And it's, it's just people it's stuff that's first. happening yeah. in your life. I mean, just... uh, the, but the way I work is my plots come first, but I spend the most time on my characters. And for me, it's about people. The people come first. But then they're not separate from the world they inhabit. So obviously, that's going to have an influence. And that's the way I approached Noughts and Crosses. It was about good friends, Sefi and Callum, who'd grown up together, but now suddenly they have to confront the world outside because the world outside is very much informing who they are and who they might be. And they, they're beginning to realise that, and it's how they confront that and deal with that. So it was very important for me that, but first and foremost, it had to be about them. So it, there were a number of ideas I had for the story, but if they didn't serve their characters, they didn't, it didn't get in the book. And that was incredibly important for me. Do you have vast notebooks of, like, rejected scenarios and rejected characters and... Not, not, not vast notebooks, because I tend to kind of plot a lot in my head before I start, and I kind of... Um, so by the time I start, I have a very good idea of where I'm going. I, um, if it's a mystery or a thriller, I will plot it out first, so I know my red herrings and I know who did it and so on. But if it's a kind of contemporary story like Noughts and Crosses, I might plot out the beginning and the middle, and then not the end, because I want to see where the characters take me. And um, that's kind of what I did with the Noughts and Crosses series. Um, I did to a certain extent with Pig Heart Boy. I did to a certain extent with this one, even though I was kind of inspired by Othello. I wanted to kind of let the characters take over. Um, but I really like doing that, because I love it when the characters take over. Because otherwise you plot, you say, OK, this is going to happen to that character, and that's going to happen to that character. But if they're real characters, sometimes they say, no, I want to go down that <laughs> alley, not that alley. And you kind of think, OK. And, I, and I've got to the stage now where I trust where they're going to take me. If I feel I've done my homework and they are real people just to see where they go, where they leave me. Um, you just told me um, earlier that you're, you've just, you're just about to start writing the sequel to Chasing yeah. the Stars. Yeah, because it's a trilogy. And it's gonna, they're going to be three. Yeah. Do you know what's going to happen in the next one? Yes, then? I do. Do you know what's going to happen in the third one? No, not yet. So you don't know what's going to happen? No, I know how the second one's going to end. Yeah. 
uh, and I kind of know where the third one's going to end, but I don't know how I'm going to get there. But with the second one, I kind of know my plot for the second one. But um, I, they, I, I haven't finished with them yet. They've got to suffer some more. So, oh, you know. I'm just, I'm just so, so, you know, I'm so, so glad so they're coming back. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, there's, so, there's some, some things I've got lined up for them. I just I like making my characters kind of really go through it. So. <laughs> what What are you actually writing now then? Because you have you you slipped another book. Yeah, so before I've got, you're writing um, the sequel. I'm writing a, a kind of a sort of dark fantasy story, but that's all I'm going to say about it. So because I hate so talking about the books I'm about to write until I finish them, because I I I, I did it before where I used to. Uh, after Pick Up Boy, I, I had an idea for a story, and I was talking about it so so much. By the time I sat down to write it, I thought. Um, but everyone knows the story, and I know the story, and all my enthusiasm had gone, so now I don't <laughs> talk about them until I've finished them. Um, are, you, are you going to write more poetry? You've, uh, yeah. You, you have written some books in poetry. Yeah. And I was th wondering if you were going to write a, a teen YA um, poet, book oh, in poetry. Yeah, I would like to. I mean, I, I wrote Cloud Busting, I which was all in um, narrative verse. And that's for more like 10, 11 year olds. Yeah, isn't sort it, of though? a 10 plus, well, 9 plus age range, yeah. 9, 10 plus age range. Um, yeah, I would like to. It's about finding a story that lends itself to being told in that form. Because with Cloud Busting, I wanted to write, it was a story about um, a boy called Sam and another boy called Davy, and it was about daring to be different and not being afraid of being different. And, um, and so when I, was, when I originally sat down to write it, I wrote it as a prose story. And it, again, it wasn't coming. And I thought, this is about being different, so I f need to find a different way of telling this. And that's when I thought, oh, maybe I'll do it in narrative verse. And, and you know, so you've got one chapter that's blank verse and another chapter that's limericks and another chapter that's haikus, but most of it is um, free form verse. Um, but I love that, and I, and I think doing it in verse lent itself to the actual thing of daring to be different. And it, and it was inspired by my daughter coming home and saying, um, and she was really upset because she said some of her friends are into fashion. And this is when she was, what, about eight, nine or something? And they were, she said, they're all talking about fashion, and I'm, that, I'm really not into that. And I said, well, well, don't pretend you are if you're not into that then fair enough, and, and maybe find somebody who's into the stuff you're into. And I said, and I thought, I, and I wanted to write it to her to not be afraid to be different and like different things to her friends. And when I was at school, I was always a misfit. And, I, and, and my friends were into stuff and I wasn't. And I, and I lived in my head a lot. Um, and you know, and I've told this before, and it's very embarrassing, but I'll tell it again. Where I used to, um, I when I was 11, I, when I start going, to, when I was going to my sort of secondary school, I used to carry around a, a leotard, a black leotard and tights in my in my in my school satchel, just in case kidnappers arrived at the school, so I could slip into the toilet, put on my leotard and tights, and I'd come out and do some action. And I really thought I was a superhero. I mean, nuts. And it was sort of like, and my friends would just go, well, that's just Laurie, ignore her. But, you know, for two years, I walked around with this leotard and tights thinking I would come out and save the day. So it was sort of like, you know, one of these things, I was always different. So, but now it's lovely because, and, and I'd always, I was always getting told off for daydreaming. And, um, and now I just think, and that's how I make my living now. I just kind of like, <laughs> it, you know, making up stories and writing them down. So it's just very ironic to me. <laughs> And you are a bit of a superhero. I, I know there's a there's right. a lovely the lovely um, Chris Riddell who's the oh, current yeah. children's laureate. Mm -hmm. You all know Mallory was the children's laureate before. He he um, made a beautiful. He's made the League of Laureates. Yes, that's right. And Mallory's obviously a very I'm important a, member. I've got, I've got a costume called I'm, I'm a Norton Cross. I'm the Norton Crosser, <laughs> and it's got got it's sort of like a costume with a zero and an X and stuff. So it looks. I love it. I must admit, I I've got it, it hanging up on my wall. So um. actually, it'd be good to really make that costume. It might, it would and be, And you can actually. carry that in your bag. I could actually, and I might wear it to Yelp next year. Do you know what? You've <laughs> got to do that. You've got to do that. <laughs> we'll have to get someone in the audience here will make it. Um, I'm aware that I, I, I want to let some people ask some questions as well, because okay. this space is, it kind of lends itself to people asking questions. And then I'm going to ask some more. I haven't finished with you, but um, I just okay. thought it would be nice. Does anyone have a question they would like to ask? Yeah, some at the front there. Yeah. Some people right at the front. Um, so we're learning about your book, Noughts and Crosses, in our English, and I just wanted to know what was the main inspiration point for the plot of the story? The main inspiration for Noughts and Crosses, it was inspired by a number of things, actually. Um, I think one of the major things was the Stephen Lawrence case. Stephen Lawrence the, was the black guy who was, um, who was beaten up and killed by five white guys. And I remember watching, and the police treated the family, so, the, the, of Stephen Lawrence's family, so shabbily. 
And I remember watching a sort of docudrama that the BBC had done and watching it just getting more and more angry about the way they'd been treated and the whole way his death had been treated. And, um, and I thought, and before I'd always been sort of, people were criticizing me for not writing about racism as if as a black author, that was the only thing I was qualified to write about. And I, would, I just wrote lots of thrillers and mysteries and whodunits and technological thrillers and all the rest of it. But then I watched that and I thought, okay, now I'm gonna write about racism. Now I'm ready to do it. And that's how Noughts and Crosses was born. And um, of all the characters I've created, um, I'd say Callum's personality is probably closest to my own. Because a lot of the stuff that Callum goes through in the book, are ba a, a lot of those incidents are based on true things that happened to me. Like uh, the first time I traveled first class on a train, the ticket inspector accused me of stealing the ticket. And uh, so that was in the book, and um, Callum goes through that. And I remember um, saying to my history teacher once, um, how come you never talk about black scientists and achievers and inventors? And she said, because there aren't any. And I remember looking at her thinking, I'm sure there must be some, mm -hmm. but I didn't know any. We'd never been taught about any, and it was only when I was in my 20s that I got to learn of all the many, many black composers and, and inventors and achievers and pioneers, etc who'd been written out of the history books, if they'd ever been written into it in the first place. But I had to learn that off my own bat. And so, Especially there's know, no internet in those days either. Well, exactly, exactly. So it makes me feel Jurassic. Sorry. But, <laughs> but yeah, it wasn't. So, you know, so it was one of those things of, um, it was only when I found the black bookshop in Islington at the time, and this was in the 1980s, and they got all my money, because I basically bought a copy of every single book in there. <laughs> and that's how I learned about black history. And I learned about people like um, Samuel Coleridge Taylor, who was called the African Marlin who lived in this country, and he was around the same time as Elgar and Britain and so forth, written out the history books. And people like Mary Seacole and Alado Equianu and so forth, who was instrumental in Wilberforce, Wilberforce fighting against slavery, but he, he written out the history books. So it was that's when I learned about not just African-American achievers, but uh, black British achievers and so forth. And so, um, and, I just, and so that was part of it. And there was an al also a lot of stuff from my childhood that I thought I had actually dealt with. And I realized when I sat down to write the book, I hadn't dealt with it, I just buried it. And then writing, that's why writing the book was such a painful thing to do, but it was so cathartic, because at the end of the book, I felt like I had really dealt with it and let it go. And I thought I had done that before, but I hadn't, I just buried it. So a lot of the stuff that Callum goes through, as I said, was based on stuff that happened to me, and, and it was kind of very painful to write about it again, but I'm really glad I did. What was your experience of reading it? Um, well, we haven't finished it so far, but um, for how far we've got, I'm really enjoying the book and I'm gripped on the characters of Sefi and Callum because Sefi's mostly more like me, more curious as to why everyone's being treated differently as well. Well, you know, that, that, that's brilliant. I mean, I'm glad that you, that you kind of are feeling the characters because um, that's what I wanted. And I, and I, and spoiler alert though, nobody tell her what happens at the end. Um, but you know, but it is, um, it's one of those things where I did want, I did want people to kind of feel for those characters and, and kind of almost live through the story as they, as my characters live through the story. So that was really important to me. So I hope you enjoy the rest. <laughs> Any more questions? Just one behind. Um, there's something in your author's note which I really like, where you say, with noughts and crosses, you knew you were writing a book that would make adults uncomfortable. As someone who is trying to write a young adult novel, how do you overcome that? And how do you write for teenagers without also having to write for their parents? I think the wonderful thing about writing for teenagers is teenagers tend to choose their own books and buy their own books. If you're writing for younger children, then you have to get past their parents first because they tend to be the ones who buy them. Um, so I think once you grab a young adult, a teen with the story, um, and there's a lot of word of mouth as well with teens and so forth. So it's about, for me, it's about remembering how I felt, which I do vividly as a teen, remembering the things that made me angry or the things that made me sad or happy or whatever, really grasping those emotions and not being afraid to put them down on paper and not censoring myself either. Um, it's, it's very easy when you're writing, uh, I suppose when I was writing um, Chasing the Stars and, I, and writing the Noughts and Crosses series, there were times when I thought, oh, should I write that? Should I? And then I thought, 
don't you dare change it. And especially like when I was writing the ending of Noughts and Crosses, in Knife Edge there's a bit between Jude and another woman called Cara, and, I, and he does something awful, and I was writing it, and a chill just went down my spine, and I thought, I can't write that, I can't write, and then I thought, don't you dare change it. And again, so it's about, it's about being, truth, being truthful in your writing. It's about um, not being afraid to take ch chances and risks in your writing if it's true to the story, and not worrying so much about pleasing the adults, you've got to please the, you know, the, the audience you're writing it for. Which is not to say you don't have to get it through adults, you, you know, if you have to get it through editors and so forth. But if it's true, I think that shines through. And I think, you know, any editor worth their salt will know if something's true or not. And they might give you some guidelines, but I think if you go in automatically trying to censor yourself, then you're doing your story a disservice. So my advice to you would be, be truthful in what you're writing. Be, try and be as authentic as possible in what you're writing and worry about the gatekeepers afterwards. Thinking about editing, what, what kind of state do you give your, your book in to the editor? Does it end up to be... Do you, do, you, do you really collaborate a lot with the editor or are you just like, Miss Perfect, here's my book. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Cross a couple of T's, <laughs> dot a couple of I's. I love that, Miss Perfect. <laughs> no. Um, no, it, it, what, it, what tends to happen is I might pass the idea about by them. I give them a sort of um, outline. Um, and then after I've written, a, I think maybe the third or fourth draft is when I... That's the first time I like to kind of get my editor involved. It depends on the story. Sometimes they get involved from the first draft, so they can just give me hints and things, or, or give me a, a sort of editorial notes. Um, I tend to like to get it as close as I feel it is, I can to being it, it being a complete thing. Um, but sometimes it doesn't work that way. So it just depends on the story, to be honest. Do you often work with the same editor? Yeah, I mean, I've, um, I've had a woman called Annie Eaton, who's been my editor since... 1990, <coughs> you know, so she's been my editor forever. And now um, at Penguin Random House, I, um, I also work with a woman called Ruth Knowles, yeah. and she's brilliant. So I'm, I've been very lucky with my, um, with my editors at Penguin Random House because they, kind of, they kind of understand what I'm trying to do and they know the way I work. And, and each writer works differently. I mean, some people like to sit and just go chapter one and see where a story takes them. I'm not one of those. I like to plan it out first. And I think it's a part because I was a computer programmer. Mm -hmm. So um, as a computer programmer, I would always kind of design my programs first and, and make sure they work logically before I started on the program. And that's how I do my books as well. And so it's very much about planning them out first. And I am I'm very much a planner. I think if I were to ever to... Um, contemplate killing somebody Ooh. I'd be I'd, I'd be a plotter and a planner and I'd be very kind of strategic about how could I do this it and get be, away with it it would be some sort of poison I think yeah po I'm, I'm really into poisons actually I better be careful with my tea there <laughs> you know what we've got so many books at home about different poisons I just think I, I, my hubby and I sort of have this joke about I hope you never die under mysterious circumstances because I would go to prison because you know they'd automatically all the evidence me. is here with Mallory all the yeah but all the books we've got in our house it's like um, how to murder someone with blunt instruments how to murder someone with poisons how to murder someone this way or that way and, and it's all the forensic stuff I love forensics <laughs> So earlier, uh, was it, yeah, earlier this year, I did um, an online course on forensic science, and it was brilliant. It was a, it was a murder at Loch Lomond, and and every week they, they showed you more evidence, and you had to go into the fingerprints and so forth, and it was fantastic. So I thought I'd like to do another one of those that year, forensic science course. So, but yeah, I love that. So and, and that's and as I said, that tends to be how I do my plotting. I think in that sense, I'd I'd be a very good plotter, but if something went wrong. Um, I don't think I'd be as good. I'm not very good at thinking on my feet. I'm very much a planner and a plotter. So. Okay. Maybe you should try to avoid this <laughs> new career path anyway. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's fun to think. I wouldn't, I wouldn't dream of actually no. killing somebody. <laughs> no. But anyway, but anyway. So. When you were a computer programmer, did you dream of being a writer? Or were you happy being a computer programmer? Or were you all a writer in the evening? No, uh, when I was... Um, 
I, I sort of fell into computing because originally I wanted to be an English teacher. And for one reason or another, that didn't happen. My, my, my careers teacher said, black people don't become teachers. And she said, why don't you do business studies instead? So I never got to do, you know, got to a uh, uni to be a teacher. Um, and then I sort of fell into computing. And I'd never touched a computer before. I started working at a software house. And I loved it. I got hooked on computing. And I stayed in that for sort of eight, uh, eight nine years. But after about the sort of sixth, seventh year, I was getting very jaded about it. And I was, um, I was working as a capital markets database manager. And that was basically tracking treasuries and bonds and, 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 and capital markets prices and all the rest of it. Oh my, I mean, yawn, <laughs> snore. Oh, God. Um, so it was, and I just thought, oh, there must be something more creative I can do with my time. And I tried an acting class for a year because I was really, I knew that's not how I wanted to spend the rest of my life, working in capital markets or computing. And I tried acting, I uh, did an acting class in, uh, sort of, uh, at the weekend at the City Lit, and I was so rubbish. Oh my God, I was useless, I really was. <laughs> and it was sort of like, and, the, and we'd all be sitting there, and the tutor would go, okay, friends, who wants to go next when we were doing improvisations? And they'd all be going, oh, Valerie, I'll go next, I'll go next. And I'd be sitting there going, oh my God, don't choose me, don't choose me. I'd, I'd sort of slide it down in my chair and absolutely hated it. But I, I did it, I got up and I would do the improvisations. But what I loved when we were working in, um, especially when we were working in pairs or groups, is coming up with the plots, for the, the, the improvisation plots. But I hated acting them out. And at the end of the course, my tutor took me to one side and she said, um, Laurie, she said, you're really good at coming up with these ideas. Have you ever thought about writing them down? Which is her way of saying, uh, you're not an actress, love, sorry. <laughs> you know, but and she was right. But that said, and I thought, oh, actually. And, I, and, and that's the first time I thought, maybe I could write for publication and get something published. And so then I joined a lot of um, writing classes, again in the evenings and at the weekend. And so there was an overlap um, between my writing and trying to get stuff published and still working in computing because I couldn't give up my job because we had bills to pay. So it took me over two years and 82 rejection letters and eight or nine different books before a publisher said yes. Um, it's interesting I, that you never, you, never, you never thought of giving up. I oh, I did. Too. No, I, I, around about my 70, 65th, 70th rejection letter, I came about that close to giving up. Because I thought if all these editors, these different editors in different publishing houses are saying no, maybe I should listen. And then I thought, I really, really, really want to be a writer. I really want to do this. And so I, th I made a deal with myself that I would wait until I had my thousandth rejection letter and then I would have a serious sit down and a think about whether or not I would be a writer. But I only got to 82, so I that's good. I love that. It's so poetic and you kind of plotted it all. Yeah, you know. well, you know, I kind I'll of made, a a I made this deal with number. myself. And, you know, and it was lovely because my, my hubby was really supportive because he said, he said, I know you. He said, if you, when you put your mind to something, you do it. And so he kind of, he always believed that I would kind of get published. And now, uh, although, as I said, at one point, I, I thought, oh, am I wasting my time here? I, got, I came that close, but thank God I carried on. So I think it's a, and, and you know what? And I joined a writing class, and in the writing class, there was such, we had some brilliant, brilliant writers. I mean, they're phenomenal, and they'd read stuff out, and it was magical. But they'd get one or two rejection letters, and we'd never see them again. And, and so it's not just about having some kind of talent, it's also about perseverance and, and, and doggedness, and you've got to keep going if that's what you really want to do. That, that is just such great advice. Does anyone else have any more questions? Yeah, we have one over here as well. Yes, and thank you. I was just wondering if, like, I think you kind of answered it in, the, um, in what you've just said, but is it like, is it hard, like, after you've written your first book, is it, like, then hard to, like, because I try to write, um, I'm good at writing the beginning of uh, stories, and then I'm like, after I get home from school, I'm going to go, I'm going to go straight to, um, straight to work, and I'm going to finish this story, and I'm uh, going to get it published and stuff. And, uh, yeah, I know that's not how it works, but, yeah, and then I just, like, I have like zero perseverance like to be able to even finish the story. So I was wondering if you had any like tips on that kind of thing. I think, I mean, my best advice to you would be, I mean, you ha again, you have to find your own way of working, but I tend to, as I said, I pop mine out first. I always try and have something go really wrong in the middle 
so that then you kind of, and it's kind of, oh gosh, what's going to happen next? So things get a lot worse before they get better. So that kind of pulls you through the story and makes me want to carry on telling, telling that story. But I think, to be honest, writing is basically the art of applying your, your buttocks to a chair and getting mm -hmm. on with it. And even if you write uh, just a page a day, at the end of the year, you'll have 365 pages. So if you set yourself a certain amount that you're going to do a day, you know, after a year, you will have, you know, a, a good bulk of a novel or more than a novel, perhaps. So it really is about you just have to sit down and have the discipline to get on with it. And it's very hard. But if you have a story that you really want to tell, um, as I said, then it's just about you've got to sit down and kind of let those characters sweep you away. But there's so many other demands for your, for your time. I mean, you've got, you've got computers and what's on the telly and films and friends and all the rest of it. But there's no substitute for just sitting down and getting on with it. So I, I don't know what to tell you apart from um, maybe plan it out first, have something go worse in the middle, something go really wrong in the middle, um, and you want to so that you really want to write it and get to the sort of the end and it's all concluded, and just you know sit down and do it. Do you always write every day? I try to when I'm writing. Yes, definitely. I mean, I kind of I tend to do all my creative stuff in the morning, so I'll write from about nine till one. And then about for and then I'll have a sort of my lunch and maybe have a, a, a play a bit of World of Warcraft and then <laughs> and then from about two till six I'll work as well. But I'll, that tends to be re-editing the stuff I did in the morning. So I do try and write every day when I'm sitting down to write a book because that's the way it gets done. You have to sit there and you have to write. So, um, Mallory, do you think reading's really important as a writer? Mm. Oh, gosh, yes. Um, I don't understand how you can write if you don't read. Um, and, I, and my thing is to try and read as widely as possible. R read as many different genres, as, as many different books, as many different authors as possible. Because um, I think I learn something from each and every book I read. And, I, and, um, and they all inspire me in one way or another. So I think uh, if you really want to be a writer, you have to read. Um, I don't see how it works otherwise. And you learn so much from... Uh, it's not to say that you're copying people, but it can inspire you to find your own ways of telling a story. And the most, the, the most important thing you have as a writer is your own voice and your own unique way of seeing the world and telling things. And so if you think, oh, I, I want to write this story, but I've never seen anyone do it quite that way before, that's brilliant. You know, do it that way, that's fantastic. And try and be a kind of original in what you're doing in, that, in the way you tell it, or the way you kind of, the, the, the way you describe things and so forth. Don't copy anyone else's style. But it has to be about kind of just reading, definitely. Mallory, read, you're... read, read. That's, in fact, <laughs> when people say to me, can you give me some advice about writing? The first piece of advice I say is read. Just read, read, read. You, I remember you, um, you had a terrible guess of writer's block once, didn't you? Mm. Oh, God, that was awful. I mean, I, um, I would sit at the computer and nothing would come. And I'd sit there like all morning and I'd have, I, I would have written maybe a couple of sentences or a paragraph, which I knew was a load of rubbish. And, I, and it, was, it was one of those things, after about three, four weeks of doing this, I thought, oh my God, I've got writer's block. I can't write anything. And, and, and I thought, am I ever going to write again? And a couple of months passed and I still hadn't written anything. And so that's when I thought, okay, I'm going to go and do other creative things. So that's when I took up my piano lessons again. I, I can't draw to save my life, but I, I started drawing and painting. Um, I started going to more art galleries and museums and so forth and just and, and a lot more theatre visits and just trying to immerse myself in lots of different creative things, which worked, thank God. Um, but it was kind of about... Um, and then I thought, don't force it, don't try and write something, just kind of go and do other creative things, and, and which worked for me, but it was really frightening because I thought, oh my God, is my career over? Am I ever going to be able to write again? So I don't want to go through that again, thank you very much. <laughs> but maybe no. that's another tip, if you, if you can't finish, <laughs> yeah. is uh, also go and do other creative things. Absolutely. Like yeah. dye your hair pink or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what, because I'm going, I'm going really grey. So I, 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 grey. So I went to my, uh, 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 my hairdresser and I said, I, I said, now I'm going grey. I said, I really want to dye all my grey bits. So he said, and I was thinking, I want to dye it like aubergine, a nice purple <laughs> colour. So we were talking about all the colours I can dye my hair next time because I've got so many grey strands. It will, it will actually show up now. But anyway, any more questions? Any more questions? We've got some more here and there's around some, there. There's, yeah, there's a lady there at the front and a lady at the back there. Hello. Hi. Um, 
so you're, um, you've just explained that you were writing a trilogy. And, um, I was writing a trilogy. Yeah, yeah. And I was wondering if um, this is because that's how you viewed the story from the start, or, and I apologize for asking this question, or if you think that um, publishing houses are, and, and the market in general, is demanding um, this type of uh, format, because of course afterwards, you know, and you have the shoulders to take this on board, um, movies are a fantastic way to take the brand towards, etc., etc. So did you want a trilogy, or does the market demand it? Uh, for me, I always saw it as a trilogy. I always thought I want to um, carry on with these characters, because I kind of had the second book, the idea for the second book while I was writing the first one. But that said, um, writing a trilogy or a series of books, if, if it's successful, um, publishers love that because it means that when, when you, as a reader, get to know the characters, you want to carry on um, reading about those characters and their lives. And um, so, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't try and make something a trilogy that I didn't feel had enough I ideas and story in there. Because, I mean, look at The Hobbit. I love the book, The Hobbit. I thought the films were terrible because the films, they made it three films, stretched it past breaking point. And, you know, and, and it's a shame because I think, I love Peter Jackson. I think he could have made a brilliant one film. As three films, I felt they didn't work. And I, so I kind of feel if something lends itself to that format, all well and good, but don't do it just because you feel you're going to get kind of more bites of the cherry and it, because in the end if people are reading it thinking well this doesn't work or you know wh why didn't you just do all this in one book then um then actually the comeback co is on you as the as the author and in fact when i wrote the noughts and crosses series um originally it was going to be the story of callum and sefi and their daughter callie rose and her and her growing up and i thought i'd get it all in one book and mm -hmm. after and i got to the end of noughts and crosses and Callie Rose had just been born, and I thought, and it was like 450 <laughs> odd pages, and I thought, okay, it's gonna be two books. And I got to Knife Edge, and it was something 300 and whatever pages, and she was like a year old. And I thought, I think it's gonna be three books, but it's only gonna be three books. And then I wrote Checkmate, and I thought, right, that's it, done and dusted. And then another of the characters who came in the third book, a, a boy called Toby Durbridge, he started whispering in my ear and saying, you know, but this is happening to me, this is happening to me. And I, as far as I was concerned, I'd spent seven years of my life on Noughts and Crosses, so that was quite enough. Um, and so I thought, no, and I was writing other things in between, but he kept whispering in my ear and I thought, okay, and I, and I got the story and I thought, this, I think this is enough to make another book. And that's how Double Cross was born. So I didn't set out to write four. Um, but I, the, I had kind of material in my head for four, and I, for me, that's the way it has to work. So I certainly wouldn't write tri trilogies just because trilogies happen to be selling. I wish I, I wish I did follow the, kind of the market more. I might, you know, I, but 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 that said, I have to. I can only write the way I write, and that and for me, I always saw that as kind of a trilogy. So we'll see. Absolutely. Any, another question. Any more? We have time. Oh, we've got time for a couple, few more. Yes. This this girl. And then over on this side, because they've yes. been a bit neglected. Um, what are some of your favourite authors, and what did you like to read when you were a teen? I've, oh, my gosh. I've got so many favourite authors. Um, you know, it's people, like, people who, anything they bring out, I will read. And that includes people like Catherine Johnson, um, Philip Pullman, Melvin Burgess, David Almond, um, Benjamin Zephaniah, all those sorts of people. Um, Anything they bring out, and I'm there, I will definitely read it. Um, and when I was kind of a teen, um, well, I, I, I'd kind of gone all the way through the children's library at, at, when I was sort of get 11, 12. So I started reading stuff in the adult library. So I was reading kind of things like Jane Austen and Jane Eyre I absolutely loved, Charlotte Bronte's Jane Eyre. Um, and then I read Rebecca by Daphne du Maurier, which I loved. But then I also read stuff that was really unsuitable mm -hmm. for 11-year-olds. Mm -hmm. I mean, things like um, <coughs> Jacqueline Suzanne and Jilly Cooper and Dennis Wheatley and so on. What about Flowers in the Attic? Did you read those I ones? did, you know, Virginia We're, we're a quite a similar age. Yeah, they were. yeah, I definitely <laughs> read Flowers in the Attic. So, you know, so it was sort of lots of books like that. But that's, you know, and then I started reading all the Agatha Christie ones. 
And, um, and I loved her plots. I mean, so the books at the time, some of them were so racist and anti-Semitic, but I loved her plots. I, you know, the woman could plot. And I loved Hercule Poirot and the Miss Marple series. So I devoured all of those. I just worked my way through everything she wrote, all the short stories and all the novels. Um, and then it was kind of lots of classics and lots of, you know, Hemingway and Steinbeck. And, and then I discovered Toni Morrison and Alice Walker when I was in my 20s. So it was lots of... Um, it, it was sort of just anything I could get my hands on. The, the, only, the only genre that I didn't really like was westerns. <laughs> and it was kind of when I was growing up, they'd have um, double westerns on a Saturday afternoon. And my mum insisted on watching them because she loved westerns. And I grew to hate them. And I, and so there was, but there was a book called Lonesome Dove by Larry McMurtry. And it was a western. And I thought, I'm not going to... Why am I even bothering to read this? And it was brilliant. Mm -hmm. And it taught me a lesson because I thought, I'm never going to do that again. Say, I don't like this genre or that genre because there's always going to be something in every genre that you're going to love. Are you going to write so. a western? Probably not. <laughs> if I wrote a Western, it would probably be, you know, a space Western or something like, like Firefly or something, you know, Joss Whedon's Firefly. But Thank you. There, 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 some questions there weren't there? many teen books, were there, though? There weren't, um, no. The Judy Bloom, did you read? I mean, well, when I, when I was growing up, you had children's books and you had adult books, yeah. and there was nothing in between. And, um, and so, you know, so I, I would just work my way around the outside, working my way around the adult library, because we didn't have books written... Um, for, for teenagers, the way you sort of you do you do now. So lucky now. Mm. Okay. Um, when you're like writing one of your books, how do you get in the mindset of your characters? Because like obviously their personalities are going to be different from your own. So like, how do you make yourself write how they feel and just that? I mean, that's a really good question, and in fact, that's where the biographies of all my major characters comes in. Because, as I said, it's not just about how they look, but it's about how they feel about things, what their politics, um, what their friends like about them, what their friends dislike about them, what kind of music are they into, etc. So it's really getting to know them as different characters. Um, um, and, then, and then it's sort of like inhabiting someone who who likes all those things. And when I was writing Double Cross, for example, Toby was very into um, Green Day and, and kind of, and, 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 a heavy, and sort of, a bit sort of light metal, alternative rock, that kind of stuff. So when I was writing him, I'd have it playing in the background. So that helped me get into that mindset. So it was about, it's about inhabiting those characters and kind of thinking, thinking about things the way they would think about them, not the way I think about them. Which is why when it came to writing from someone like Jude's point of view, because Jude is like a stone killer, that was kind of, that was, that was kind of creepy, but it was fun, because it was kind of like, obviously he, him, his way of viewing the world and mine was so different, and I can't, but it was really brilliant, kind of trying to get into his head and write it from his perspective. So for me, as I said, the, I think the, the major thing that helps me do that is the little biographies I do of each of my main characters first. So if I'm doing a, a part of the story or the whole story from their point of view, then I really know them before I start so that I know how they will react in any situation. Because it's the characters, I think, that make or break a story. Like, for example, if suddenly it was, there was a flash of light and then it went really dark in here, and, and, then, and then it was all dark outside and you couldn't open the doors. And if you looked out the windows, all you saw were stars. So the whole planet had disappeared apart from this room, this ballroom. We're all in the same setting. We're all in that same situation. But how each of us would react to it depends on our character. And that's what would make the story interesting. How, would, you know, which one would we freak out? Would we, would people start killing other people, you know, or whatever? What would happen? And, and that's the interesting bit, what, what the characters do. Um, and so, as I said, the plot I find really easy. The plot would be, suddenly the world disappears and it's just this room. But it's the characters you have to work on and make real and, and to know how they would react in that situation. And that's the fun bit. That's the hard work of writing, but that's the fun bit. Are you a big people watcher, Mallory? Oh, I'm a terrible people watcher. Oh my God! When I, let's like, I drive my husband crazy. When I when I um, go to a restaurant or whatever, I sit there and I'm just watching people. And he's going, "Hello, I'm here." <laughs> and you know, but I just love watching people. And I'm one of these like, I sit behind people on a train or a bus, and I'm just I'm just kind of listening to their conversations. <laughs> it, and I, that's why 
always have a notepad and pen in my in my handbag because I write down lots of bits of dialogue and things and things I wouldn't have think of. And I love it. I mean, and it's wonderful because you know I've always been nosy, but now I can call it research. So it's brilliant. So I can say, and he goes out oh, for God's sake. Why are you so nosy? And I say, oh, it's research, love. It's research. So I, I love my job. I love is, my job. Is there anyone a bit like your husband in your in your any of your books? I think. Oh yeah, I think. Um, I think that on the loyalty front and the, the, the way, you know, my, my hubby, bless him, kind of would do anything for his family, for me and, 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 and Lizzie, our daughter. And so Toby, I think, was kind of a bit based on him because Toby's very loyal. And when um, Callie Rose ends up getting shot, he's going to go after the people who are responsible for it. And so that kind of loyalty, that fierce, fierce loyalty was kind of a bit inspired by my hubby. Oh. So. Yeah. Any more questions? We've got time for more. There's someone there at the back. Yeah, there. 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 Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Hi. Hi. Um, so I guess, sorry, I have, I've lost my, throat, my voice. Um, is there anything you would change about your career? Is there anything I'd change about my career? <sighs> um, wow. <laughs> um, do you know what? I don't think so. Um, I mean, the... It would have been nice to maybe kind of have written Harry Potter or something, I don't know, but I don't know, I don't, I don't think so. I think, I think, I, I, I set out to write certain books and I, I set out to um, tell my own stories and I kind of feel I've, I've done that. And some of it has been a hard slog, um, but I think it's made me a, a sort of stronger person and I hope it's made me a better writer. So I think even the things that have failed, I've learned a lot from. Um, and in fact, I've probably learned more from the things that have failed than the things that have succeeded. But that it's all a learning curve, and and I I don't think I would change anything to be honest. I mean, I look back at my life, and there's been some terrible, terrible things I've had to go through. But then I look back and think, but then you were it's led to good things, and it's and it made me stronger, or it made me think I'm going to do this, and I'm not going to let anyone stop me, and so on. And so I just think. Um, I, I just think I, if I changed anything, it's like it's like one of my favourite episodes of Star Trek: Next Generations, where Captain Picard um, regrets something he did in his youth because he was a bit of a hothead, and he and it ended up with him having to have he got in a fight, got his heart injured, and he had to have something in his heart or his heart replaced or whatever. So he wishes he hadn't done that, and he goes back, and and it, his wish is granted, and it unravels his whole life because it kind of put his life in perspective and it made him go out and, and, and he became captain. And in this alternate life, he was an ensign, nobody noticed him or whatever. And all because he wished he could just unpick one thread of his life. I mean, the episode's called Tapestry. And I thought it was really interesting because I thought I could go... But if I, I, There's lots of things I regret and there's lots of things I'd like to go back and change. But changing those things might mean I would never have become a writer might not have had the life I have now. And I kind of think I'm really lucky because I'm doing a job I love. So is there anything I changed? No. Mm -hmm. I suppose no. you very easily could have been that English teacher if, if, yeah. if your career teacher has been less racist. <laughs> but you know what? I, I, I was a volunteer reader's helper at my local school for three years. And there was, a, there was a school trip to the Museum of the Moving Image when it was around, just around the corner from here. And they asked me if I could uh, help out on that. And I had six children to look after, six. <laughs> and we got the, tube, the train up, and it was like herding cats. And I, just, and I felt like I was just running around after these six kids and saying, could you hold hands and let's all stay together and whatever. And it was half a day, and I came home. I went straight to bed. I was so exhausted. So I thought, maybe I didn't have the stamina to be a teacher after all. So, you know, so it's one of those things I think, well, you know, it never happened. And part of me regrets that because I, I love the idea of kind of, um, of infusing kids about books and reading. You have done that a little bit, though. Yeah, but I kind of feel like, I, I hope I've done that with kind of with the books I've written. That's so. what I mean. You've done yeah. it. That's what you've devoted your whole life to. Well, there you go. You know, so, so, it, so I, I guess it's my mama has this saying, what's for you doesn't go by you. And I think maybe this was the way I was meant to do it rather than being a teacher. So, although I wasted a good few years of my life hating my careers teacher because she said, when I said I wanted to be an English teacher and I wanted to go to uni, and she said, um, oh, black people don't do that. She said, why don't you be a secretary instead? And I, and I wasted what, three, four years of my life because I thought she'd ruin my life and all my aspirations. 
And, and I look back now and I think actually she did me a huge favour because it meant that afterwards I got into Goldsmiths off my own bat once I had my A-level results and then I didn't go because I thought I'd work for a year and make some money, then I'll go to Goldsmiths. And I got hooked on computing, so I gave up my place at, at college anyway. But that said, it taught me that if someone stands in my way, do not let them stop you. You just don't stand there wasting time arguing with them. You just find a way to go around them. And sometimes it's a, it's, a, it's a longer route, but you find a way to go around them. And that's when I was getting all those rejection letters. I thought, well, if they don't like this book, maybe they'll like the next one. Or if they don't like, you know, if this editor doesn't like it, maybe this, another editor will like it. And it just taught me, don't take no for an answer. So she did me a favor. And I look back on all the sort of things that happened in my life, all the bad things, and think, but actually, this is what I learned from it. And this is how it moved me forward. So I, you know, I can't complain. I really can't complain. Any more questions? There's one over there. Oh, well, then we've got to, I think this might be the last question. Hi. Sorry, um, now that you've uh, delved into sci-fi, um, would you, um, will the next thing you write go back to it? Or would you like to delve into fantasy? Or maybe write some Firefly books? <laughs> <laughs> well, Firefly's been done. It's been taken. Uh, my next one's going to be fantasy. Ooh. And then after that, it's going to be sci-fi. But I did sci-fi before when I did a book called Thief about a girl who gets knocked unconscious and she wakes up and it's 40 years in the future and she gets to meet herself and she's become really bitter and evil all because of something that happened when she was a child. And, um, and so I've kind of dabbled in sci-fi before and I wrote another book called Robot Girl um, and another book called Contact for Barrington, publisher Barrington Stokes. So they're kind of sci-fi-y. But I, I'm, I mean, I'm really lucky because I can kind of go where my interests are. And I, my next one's definitely going to be a fantasy one. And that was inspired at the Yelp this year, in fact, because my daughter, who went with me, she said, um, she said, how come you haven't written that many fantasy books, that very many fantasy books? And I said, because magic scares me. And she said, well, there you are then. And I thought, oh, OK. And I instantly got an idea for a story. And then that night, I had this dream. Um, which was, a, it was horrible, oh God. <laughs> but it basically, it was me do, um, dabbling in magic and um, this creature came up and I was trying to control it and I couldn't. And then it, it kind of, I was under a railway bridge, sort of a road, but under a railway bridge. And this creature was following me and I was trying to get away from it. And it looked at me with a really evil look. Mm -hmm. And it suddenly ran past me. And, it was, quite, you know, it was sort of like where you are now. And it ran past me to, like, where that post is. And it had a knife in its hand. And the knife was just dripping blood. And I was looking at this creature grinning at me. And I thought, he's just sliced my stomach open. <sighs> and I thought, don't look down, don't look down. Because then I'd see all my guts hanging out and I would die. And I thought, don't like this dream and force myself to wake up. But I thought, oh, that's kind of, that's, that's giving me an idea for a story. So that's what I'm working on. But it was so, you know, it's one of these things I think, you know, when people say, what, you know, where do you get your ideas from and stuff, it tends to be things that, that make me angry or make me happy or scare me or whatever. You know, so, and it's kind of tapping into those emotions. And the idea of um, doing some, you know, dabbling in something where you don't know all about it and and calling up something that has dire consequences I love so oh you know. I'm looking forward to that one <laughs> that sounds scary <laughs> so it's going to be dark <laughs> fantasy definitely um, you, you love graphic novels don't you mm. you're a massive massive fan oh god yeah um so you Noughts and Crosses was made into um did you actually write the graphic novel for Noughts and Crosses I didn't it was um Ian Edgerton yeah Ian Edgerton adapted the the, the book and John Aggs did the illustrations. It was, it's brilliant, isn't it? Do you love it? Oh, I love. Oh, absolutely. I think they both did such a brilliant job. And I love graphic novels anyway. So it's lovely to kind of think. Oh, you know, Noughts and Crosses has been turned into a graphic novel. I, and I feel I've been so lucky with that book because the RSC in 2008 oh, yeah. did the, a play of it, which toured the country. And now the BBC are doing the yes. series of it. And when that's going to be. When's that starting? Um, hopefully next year, end of next year. But I think they're. Um, they're still kind of casting it and whatever. So, and so if anyone's interested in acting in it, it has nothing to do with me. <laughs> you need to get in touch with the um, the production people. But um, but you know it's so exciting. And yeah. I read the first episode, which I loved. And it's and so it's just I just feel I've just been really really lucky with that book. 
really lucky. Well, we were lucky that you, you, you wrote it and gave it to us. Um, are you going to have any involvement in the, um, the BBC production? Well, I think they're going to send me the scripts and so forth. And I think, but, you know, and, uh, sort of as a courtesy, which is lovely. Um, but I'm kind of going to leave them to get on with it and hope I get to see the screenings or whatever. But it's, um, I'm but sure they, you'll be invited. But, you know, <laughs> but, you know the, but the, when the RSC were doing it, it depends how they work, because when the RSC were doing the play, uh, Dominic Cook, the, the brilliant, brilliant director, he invited me to the auditions and the rehearse, some of the auditions and rehearsals. And that was fascinating, because suddenly all these, creatures, all these people who'd lived in my head Suddenly, it was actors coming in and reading for the parts, and, and, and Dominic deliberately picked the sort of a kissing scene from the book, and he had these actors and, act, actors and actresses turning up, never met each other before, and they'd have to read lines to do the kissing scene. And I thought, oh my God, I, I tip my hat to you actors, because imagine <laughs> having to snog someone you've only just met. But it was brilliant just watching him, because his thing was about, um, let's see how they cope in that situation, and I want someone who's gonna just go for it, etc. And I loved just being in the audition process and, the re and then in the rehearsals and watching the way he worked and getting them to kind of really get to grips with the characters. It was amazing. Such a, and it was such an opportunity. So I'm hoping I, I can get to go and watch some of the filming. I'd love that. And, and do you think the play was cast right? Did you love oh God, the, yeah. the, the actors oh God, they chose? Yeah. I think Dominic did such a fantastic job because he adapted the book and he directed it. And he did an amazing job. So I, and I'm, you know, and so I think um, a mammoth productions who are, in, who are doing noughts and crosses for, for the BBC, uh, they are, we've had, we've had a couple of meetings and they are, they really understand what I was trying to do with the book and so forth. So I, I've got real, really, I've got such high hopes for this. I think, because as I said, I read the first episode and I thought it was brilliant. And I was just kind of, oh gosh, you know, and it was, uh, and, I, and it's, um, and it's, a lot of things that are not in the book, well, not a lot of things, but there were some things in the script that weren't in the book, and I thought, oh, I wish I'd put that in the book, I wish I'd put that in the book. So it is amazing. The script is absolutely amazing, so I'm so looking forward to it. And I'm, as I said, I'm hoping... It's like when Pick Up Boy was on, and I, I had a little cameo in that, so, you know, it's just, I love having my little cameos in the things that are kind of are you, are you going to have a cameo then? I haven't asked them yet, but I Ooh. might do. I'll just say, can, you know, can I have a little non-speaking cameo? I'll, I'll be in the background somewhere, because that would be kind of cool. <laughs> but you know what? When I was doing um, Pick Heart Boy, um, they, I said, can I have a little cameo? So they said, no, no problem. So I had a doctor's coat on. I was <laughs> in a hospital scene. And they also asked me if I had... Um, they wanted to borrow a tea towel from me, which had Barbados on it, because my parents are from Barbados. So there's a bit in it where Mona Hammond, who plays the nan, has to take some scones or something out of an oven. And, uh, and she's taking it out with my, my tea towel that's got Barbados on it. And, and, and my scene is, blink and you miss me. And the tea towel is on the screen for at least a good five, six seconds. <laughs> I thought, the tea towel, they obviously felt the tea towel acted better than I did, because it had a longer it. part, but there you Upstage go. Upstaged by a tea towel. Yeah, indeed, indeed. <laughs> at least it was my tea towel, so there you go. Well, Mallory, it's always a pleasure to speak to you. You're so interesting. You're just a creative force, and it's just so exciting. You're the writer that I always want. Anything you write, I'll always read oh, thank you, immediately. Emily. And um, and thank you so much. And oh, my join pleasure. me in saying thank you to Mallory. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs>